Hey guys, my name is Sam and today we're going to be looking at the 2021 R-Level Maths Paper 2 Question 8. So this question covers a variety of different topics from the Leaving Cert Math Syllabus and in my opinion is definitely one of the harder questions on this paper. So let's jump right into the video. So this is a statistics and probability question worth 50 marks. And so we're told in part A that all first years in the school sat a common maths exam and the results in integer values were normally distributed with a mean of 176 marks and a standard deviation of 36 marks. And we're told that the top 10% of the students will go forward to a county maths competition. So in part one, we're being asked to find the minimum mark needed on the exam to progress to the county stage. So before we get into this question, let's try and decipher what we actually need to work out to solve this question. So basically, we want to find the minimum mark needed to be in the top 10%. So in other words, we're looking for the boundary between the top 10% and the bottom 90%. So with a lot of problems, I'd always recommend trying to visualize it. So looking at this normal distribution of drawn in red on the right, we're looking for some mark on this exam X that for this value X, 90% of the students will lie below this mark. So in other words, this mark X is the boundary between the top 10 and the bottom 90. So how we're gonna solve this is we're gonna open up our logbook and find the Z score that corresponds to being in the top 90% of students. So opening up our logbook, we're looking at the area under the standard normal curve section. And basically we have this set of tables and what we're looking for is we're looking for a probability of 90%, or in other words, all students within 90%, we're looking for that Z-score. So we're looking for a value of 0.9 in our tables. So looking at this first page, we can see it only goes up to 0.8621. So we're gonna to have to go on to the next page. So again, we're looking for 0.9. And if you look at the table long enough, you'll be able to see that the closer we can get to that will be 0.8997. And we can see that the z-score that corresponds to this p-value is going to be 1.28. Before we go back to the question, there is one more thing we need from the logbook, and that is our standardizing formula. So this formula states that our z-score, which in this case is 1.28, is going to be equal to the x that we're looking for minus our mean divided by our standard deviation. So we know our z-score, our mean, and our standard deviation. And so if we input all of these numbers into our formula, we'll be able to solve for x. Back to our question, I've written down our formula again. So let's fill in our mean, standard deviation, and our z-score. From here, I want to multiply across both sides by 36 to get rid of the denominator on the right-hand side. And so finally, to find our value for x, we need to add both sides by 176. And finally, we find that x is equal to 228.08. However, we recall that the results were given in integer values. And as this is not an integer, or in other words, it's not a whole number, we have to either round up or round down. So normally when you have 222.08, you'd normally round down. However, if we did that, we'd actually end up with a score that would put you in the bottom 90% of results. So we actually need to round up to put us inside the top 10%. So although we might be a little bit above that borderline, this is the lowest mark that will get you inside that top 10%. And so our final answer will be a score of 223 marks. And finding this will give you the full 10 marks for this question. Moving on to part two. Basically, what we're trying to look for is you're trying to find the percentage of students who scored between 165 and 210 marks. So again, let's try and visualize this. So looking at our bell curve on this right-hand side, I've marked in roughly where a student with 210 marks would be on the normal distribution, and roughly with a student where 165 marks would be. And basically what we're trying to do is we're trying to find the percentage of students who fall between the two of these, or in other words, this yellow region that I've just drawn. You may be wondering though, how on earth am I meant to find this yellow region? And there actually is quite a clever way of doing so. So what we want to do is we want to find the percentage of students who scored 210 marks or below, which are marked in purple. And then we want to find the percentage of students who scored 165 marks or lower, which are marked in yellow. And then finally, 
to find the region between 210 and 165 which we're looking for which I've just highlighted is we take the purple region and then we subtract away the yellow region and that will give us our final answer. So first things first we must find this purple region and find this yellow region. So first of all we must find the z-scores associated with the mark of 210 and the z-score associated with the mark of 165. So we have the same standardizing formula as in the last part to find our z-scores but this time we just have to input our x with the same mean and the same standard deviation as before. So a z-score for a test mark of 210 will be 0 0.94 and then our z-score for a test mark of 165 will be negative 0 0.31. Both of these correct to two decimal places. So what we're going to be using our logbook for is we're looking for the probability that z is less than 0 0.94 minus the probability that z is less than negative 0 0.31. However, we cannot actually use our logbook to find the probability of something being less than 0. So we can actually rewrite this term as 1 minus the probability that z is less than positive 0 0.31. So opening up our logbook, again on the area under the standard normal curve page, first of all we're looking for our z-score of 0.94. So we can see on the left we have 0.9 here, and on the top we have 0 0.04 here. And so the percentage we get is 0 0.8264. And then the second z-score we're looking for now is positive 0.31. So we can see on the left we have 0.3 here, and on the top we have 0 0.01 here, and so the percentage we get is 0 0.6217. And so these are the two percentages we're going to use to solve our question. So back to our question, looking at the bottom right hand corner here, I'm actually just running out a bit of space here, but we have 0 0.8264 minus 1 minus 0 0.6217, because remember, we're actually looking for the probability of z being less than negative 0 0.31, and this will give us our final probability of 0 0.4481. And then lastly, to finish off the question, the question asks us to find the percentage of first years who receive their certificate of merit. So we just have to quickly change this percentage and that is very easily done. And so we get our final answer of 44.28%. And finding this will give you the full 10 marks for this question. So looking at part B, it says a news report claimed that six-year students in Ireland studied an average of 21 hours per week and a Leaving Cert class surveyed 60 students in sixth year chosen at random from different schools and had found that the average study time was 19.8 hours with a standard deviation of 5.2 hours. So in part one of this question, we're being asked to find the test statistics of this sample mean. So when you're finding the test statistics or z-score of a sample mean, you actually do not use the same standardizing formula that we used in the first couple of parts of this question. Our test score is actually given by x, where x is our sample mean, minus mu, which is going to be our population mean, which in this case is 21 hours, which is given by the news report. And then that's all divided by s, which is our sample standard deviation, divided by square root of n, where n is the number of students in our survey. And so from the question, we know that x is equal to 19.8, mu is equal to 21, s is equal to 5.2, and finally n is equal to 60. And so finally, after inputting all of these numbers into our test statistic formula, we'll get our final answer for our test statistic of negative 1.787. And finding this will get you the full five marks for this question. Moving on to part two. First of all, we're being asked to find the p-value of this test statistics. And then what we have to do is comment on what can be concluded from its value in a two-tailed hypothesis test at the 5% level of significance in relation to the news report claim. All right, first things first, before we even worry about that second part, let's worry about our p-value. So basically, what a p-value is, is it's the probability that a certain event will occur by random chance. So to find our p-value, the first thing we must compute is the probability that z is less than our test statistics of negative 1.787. But as I said in a previous part of this question, this can actually just be written as 1 minus the probability that z is less than 1.79. And you might notice there, I've rounded it up to 1.79, as that is the most decimal places that we can look at using our logbook. So without further ado, let's try compute this value here. So again, looking at this page of the logbook, 
we can see our Z scores only go up to 1.0, but we're looking for 1.79, so we have to go to the next page. And so on to the next page, we can see on the left, we have 1.7 over here, and on the right, we have 0.09 over here. And so the probability that we're going to be looking for is 0 0.9633. So before we actually use that information we've just found out, let's actually find exactly what our p-value is going to be. And what it's going to be is it's going to be 2 times 1 minus the probability of z being less than 1.79. And the reason it's 2 times that is because this is a two-tailed hypothesis test. So we computed this to be 0 0.9633 and so we have our p-value to be 2 times 1 minus 0 0.9633 and that is going to be equal to 0 0.0734 and that is our p-value correctly computed. Next it's on to the conclusion. So normally with a hypothesis test if the question is asked you to say perform a hypothesis test would have to give our null hypothesis and our alternative hypothesis. However, since here we're simply being asked for conclusion in relation to a hypothesis test, we don't need to do that step. So the main conclusion we can make here is we must determine whether this p-value here is greater than or less than our 5% level of significance. And so since 0 0.0734 is greater than 0 0.05, this means we do not have enough evidence to claim that the news report is incorrect. So let's write down that. And so writing this conclusion or something similar with your correct p-value will get you the full 10 marks for this question. So moving on to part C and moving into a bit of probability, long story short, we're told that there's a box with 23 keys in it and that 12 of them are for classrooms, 6 are for labs and 5 are for offices. So in part 1, we're being told that 4 keys are drawn at random from the box and then we're asked what is the probability that the fourth key drawn is the first office key drawn. So in other words, we're going to have three draws from the box, none of which are going to be office keys, and then on that fourth and final draw, we'll get an office key. And we're trying to find the probability of that happening. So for this year's paper, there was actually two different ways you could do this question and get full marks for both ways. So normally with a question like this, the question would specify whether you should replace the keys after you take it out of the box, which means you take a key out, look at it, then put it back in, or if you shouldn't replace the keys when you put it back in the box, or if you shouldn't replace the keys after taking it out from a box. And so with no replacement, it would be like you take a key out, leave it aside, take another key out, leave it aside. And so depending on which way you draw from the box, you'll get different probabilities, but both will give you full marks, and I'm actually going to show you how to do both of them today. So first of all, with no replacement, or in other words, we're not putting the keys back, we have four draws, one, two, three, and four. We're going to denote not drawing an office key with an N and drawing an office key with a Y. So we can see that for the first three draws, we have Ns, and then for the fourth draw, we have a Y. So now let's try and find the probability of each of these Ns and Ys occurring. So for our first draw, we know we don't want to pick an office key. So since there are 12 general classrooms and six science lab keys, that means there's a total of 18 keys we can draw which are not an office key. And since there are 23 keys in total, the probability of taking a key that is not an office key is 18 divided by 23. So now we're looking at the second draw. So we know after the first draw that took place that either one of the classroom or one of the science lab keys have been taken out. So now there's only 17 keys left that aren't office keys. Similarly, there's actually only 22 keys left in total as one's been taken out. And so the probability of a non-office key being taken on the second draw is 17 over 22. And finally, for the third draw, which isn't an office key, again, there's going to be one less classroom and one less science key. So there's only going to be 16 non-office keys. And also there's only going to be 21 keys left to choose from. So the probability on the third draw of not getting office key is 16 over 21. And finally, for our fourth draw, we still have all five office keys left. However, since we've already took three keys out, there's only 20 left. And so the probability of on the fourth draw of getting an office key is going to be five divided by 20. And then to find the probability of all of these happening together, we simply have to multiply them all together. And this will give us our answer of 0 0.1152 correct of four decimal places. Now we're going to look at the case if they were replaced. So again, we have four draws, the first three being N's and the last one being a Y. 
However, this time, the probability of drawing an N will be the same for each draw. So just as before, for the first draw, we have 12 general classroom and 6 science staff keys, so 18 in total which are at office, and 23 in total, so again the probability of the first draw of drawing a non-office key is 18 over 23. So since this time we're putting our keys back, the probability of drawing a non-office key on the second draw is going to be the exact same as it was on the first, so again it's 18 over 23. It's going to be the exact same for the third draw as well. And then the probability of drawing an office key on the fourth draw is going to be 5 because there's 5 office keys divided by 23 because there's 23 keys in total. And once again, to find the percentage of it happening all together, we simply multiply them all together. And this will give you a slightly lower probability than before of 0.1042, correct, to 4 decimal places, which is your final answer. And as I said before, it made no difference as to what method you used, as it, the question did not make clear whether there was replacement or not. And so whether you gave the first or the second answer that I've given, you'll get full marks. And full marks for this question was 10 marks. Moving on to part two, we're told that all the keys are returned to the box. So we have all 23 keys. And then three keys are drawn at random from the box, one after the other, without replacement. So this time we're definitely told that there is no replacement thank you state examinations commission so what we're being asked to do is find the probability that one of them is for the general classroom one is for the science lab and one of these keys is for the office so before we even start worrying about probabilities let's try and think about the different ways we could draw an office key a classroom key and a lab key from 23 keys so what i'm going to do is i'm going to note a general classroom key by a G, a lab key by an L, and an office key by an O. So one way we could take three of these keys out is we could take a classroom key out first, a lab key out second, and an office key out third. Another way we could do it is we could take a general classroom key out, then an office key, then a lab key, or we could take an office key, then a general classroom key, then a lab key. And spoiler alert, there's actually six different ways we can do this. And I've just written them all out there in case you weren't sure as to how I got six. However, there is a much quicker way of finding all the different ways stuff can be ordered. And that is by doing the factorial function on our calculator. So here, if we put three factorial into our calculator, we'd get six, which is also the different ways three keys could be arranged. So what three factorial is equal to is equal to three times two times one. And I'll give you a quick explanation of how factorial actually tells you the different ways things can be ordered. So let's say we have three objects and we have these three boxes which I've drawn in purple. And I wanna find the total different ways that we can put three different items into these three different boxes. So when we're looking at the first box, we know we have a choice of three different objects to put in this box. However, when we get to the second object, since we've already put an object into the first box, we only have a choice of two. And then finally, with the third box, since we've already put two objects into the two boxes previous, we only have a choice of one. And so to find the total different number of ways we could have put our objects into these boxes is by multiplying these numbers together, which is actually just going to equal three factorial. If we had five objects and five boxes, it would be five factorial, 10 boxes, 10 objects, 10 factorial, and so on and so forth. So now that we know the different number of ways we can take out our keys, Let's try and find the probability of taking out these keys in order. So let's take the example of taking a general classroom key, then a lab key, then an office key. So we know we have 12 classroom keys and 23 keys in total. So with the first draw, the probability of taking a classroom key is 12 divided by 23. And then on the second draw, we want to take a lab key out. But remember, we are replacing them. So there's actually only 22 keys to choose from. And since there's six lab keys in total, the probability of on the second draw of taking a lab key is going to be 6 divided by 22. And then finally, on our last draw, we want to draw an office key. And there's five of those. However, we're not replacing them, so there's only 21 keys left. So it's going to be 5 divided by 21. And then to find the probability of these three happening together, we simply have to multiply them together like so. But then, since there are six different ways we can actually order these three keys, we actually multiply that whole probability by six, or in other words, by three factorial. 
And this will give us our final answer of 0.2033, correct of four decimal places. So finding this will give you the full five marks for this part of the question. So I really hope you guys enjoyed today's video and I hope I was able to give you a good grasp of how hypothesis testing and also just how general test statistics and Z scores work. And I also hope I was able to give you a good understanding into the difference of replacing something and not replacing something when drawing it from a hat or in this case, drawing it from a set of keys. So I really hope you guys liked today's video and I'll hopefully see you guys soon.